Today, um, we're going to be going over the guide to conducting exhibit for, conducting formative evaluation on accessible programming. Um, and both Christine and I work at the Museum of Science in Boston, and we've been working with our Beyond site for um, some evaluation of their multi-site uh, museum accessibility study. And one of the projects that we worked on in collaboration with them was developing this guide uh, to, so that people could conduct formative evaluations of their own programs to really think critically about how is the program working, how could it be improved. So we wanted to uh, have this webinar as a chance to share uh, some more background about how to use the guide, give a little bit more explanation. Um, and some of you who are on the call, I know, uh, helped us pilot test this last summer. So for at least some of you, we know it's familiar. And hopefully, uh, during some of the Q&A and discussion portions, those of you who have used it can hop in and tell us a little bit about your experiences. Uh, so today on the webinar, we're going to talk in general a little bit about what is formative evaluation, introduce you to the guide if people haven't had a chance to see it yet, uh, review steps in the formative evaluation process, and then uh, and, and what that would look like for thinking about your own programs. And then we'll also walk through an example scenario to give us something concrete uh, to really think about here. So let's start by talking about formative evaluation in general. And formative evaluation is really good uh, as a way to think about your own programs and improve your own work. Um, and especially for this particular group of people and this study, um, it's a way for to really think critically about how it can be inclusive of people who are blind or have low vision. And um, it's a good way for programs that are still evolving, still changing, where you can make tweaks to think about what those changes could be and really incorporate the voice of the audience into that decision making. Um, and it is nice because it's an iterative, ongoing process. You can collect information from a, a smaller number of people, make some changes, then talk to some more visitors to see if that worked and if you're headed in the right direction. So it's really a way to make improvements to the program, to think about the accessibility of your program, and how it's really meeting the needs of people who are blind or have low vision. Um, and really, as I said, it's an iterative process. So you're making changes, you're collecting more information, and you're making more improvements in an ongoing way. And this is different than summative evaluation, which is what a lot of people think of when they think of evaluation, which is generally a larger scale study to really measure the impact or effectiveness of a program or an exhibit um, or an activity. And really, that's focusing on a final product and being able to make claims about how effective it is, about uh, what people are learning, about what they're getting out of the program. And um, that's not what we're intending to talk about today, and that's not what we developed the guide for. Um, the guide was really focused at, on people who did not have a background in evaluation, but might want to conduct formative evaluation of the programs, which is um, a, a great way for people to think critically about their own programs and improve them. But generally, summative evaluations in these larger scale studies to draw conclusions about the efficacy of a program or the impact of it are conducted by people with uh, a more evaluation background since it's a larger, more complex study. So as I mentioned, we worked on this guide with RPM site and piloted it, I think, even with some of you who are calling in today. Um, and we intended it as a resource for people who would uh, want to improve their programs, especially those focused on visitors who are blind or have low vision, and really get people thinking about the process of formative evaluation, what questions you want to ask, um, how you can go about collecting that information, and how you can analyze it and apply it. Um, and what um, we're looking at, uh, as I said, is really focusing on those visitors who are blind or have low vision. But we do know that it can be useful, um, especially in mixed programs uh, that have the general visiting public in them. You certainly can get their feedback. Um, and you can always uh, use this for you know, general visits if you're worried about doing formative evaluation around accessibility and inclusion beyond just a single program. Some of these things might apply as well. 
Um, so within the formative evaluation guide, uh, which Joan included in a link in her email, um, we really described the steps of the formative evaluation process and what that looks like, which we'll go into in a little more detail. Uh, throughout the guide, there are tip boxes that give you a little bit more concrete detail of what to do. Um, and then at the end, there's a question bank of possible questions if you do want to conduct interviews or do surveys. Um, and then some example instruments to really look at, uh, you know, what this might look like in a definitive way. Okay. While we work on fixing the video, I'm just going to say a few things that are off script about um, formative evaluation. And one of the things that I want to highlight for you is, you know, we wrote the guide, we did go through this idea of um, steps of a formative evaluation process. Um, <clears throat> there's kind of two points I'd like to make. One is that um, oftentimes people think of evaluation as being something that's formulaic. Um, that there's a certain formula that you need to follow, that there's certain um, steps that you need to take in an exact way. Um, but actually, formative evaluation in particular is more um, cyclical. And what matters is that not that you follow a particular formula, but that you're systematic. Um, systematic in terms of what it is that you investigate, systematic in terms of how it is that you gather your data, and systematic in terms of how you look at your data in the end. So as we go through this today, I think it will be really important for you to think, keep in mind um, that what we're trying to teach you to do is to be systematic um, and that formative evaluation is cyclical. And one of the, um, the strengths of it um, and also one of the great frustrations is that sometimes after completing your first study, you have more questions than you do answers. And what's great about doing formative evaluation in kind of a quick, iterative way um, is it enables you to keep investigating um, the answers to the questions that you develop, and that's what makes it a strong learning experience for, for professionals. What I'll do is kick it over to Christine, who will now talk to you about those steps in the formative evaluation process and that cyclical process. So we're going to be going, to be going through most of the content that is already in the guide, um, but we know that sometimes some added extra content from people who've gone through this process before can be helpful. So if any of you have read through the guide and questions have come up, please feel free to enter them into the chat. We can incorporate that into our presentation. And we will have an opportunity for some verbal questions as well at a certain point in the process. Um, even though, as I said, it's cyclical, it's um, iterative, um, it's important to be systematic, there are generally some kind of steps that you need to go through and some that should, not by necessity, precede other steps. And so we're going to walk through what those steps are in the process. The first one that's the most critical is identifying what it is that you want to learn. Oftentimes when people are thinking about what it is that they want to learn, they go straight to writing um, survey questions. So they're thinking about, okay, well, I want to ask questions about demographics. I want to ask questions about whether or not they enjoyed it. I want to ask questions about what they learned. But I think what's important is to take a step back before you start writing your survey questions before you start developing your interview guide or your observation protocol and figuring out for you as a professional or for your professional team, what is it that you want to learn um, through this formative evaluation process? Because it really is a tool for professionals to learn more about how to improve their work. So one way to start is by defining and reviewing your program. Oftentimes you have in your head um, kind of this mixture of things that you want the program to accomplish. So those are your, your outcomes or your outputs. So you want your program to reach a certain number of people. Those are your outputs. You want your program to help um, visitors learn something about particular um, content or um, about a particular skill. Those are your outcomes. And it's often hard you have them in your head that you haven't articulated them. To do evaluation, it's really important that you put those down um, on paper and you share them with others and amend them past others so that you know what it is that you want to achieve in the end. Um, what is also really important is that you map out what's called your program theory of action. And we're just briefly talk about this today, but there's some great writings by a woman by the name of Carol White who talks about um, how to map out your program theory model that's um, interesting for those who want to learn more. And what it means, your program theory of action, is why is it that you do what it is that you do? Um, so we recently um, 
we're leading a, an evaluation that's being conducted by a group of students of a, a program here at the Museum of Science. And the educators expressed to um, the students who are doing the evaluation that what they really enjoy doing is creating an interactive program where visitors speak directly to them and they ask them questions and they say statements back and then they um, encourage the visitors to um, pick from a different variety of different content areas that they can pursue. And they, the um, staff felt that that was really important for achieving a particular outcome of people feeling engaged with the program. And then if people felt engaged with the program, they'd be more likely to learn the content. So we just mapped out that theory of action. What was really important in mapping that out is that one of the things that we learned was that that type of back and forth to the educator actually wasn't what um, kept the visitors really engaged. It actually kept the educators engaged, but not the visitors. There's many other aspects of the program that kept the visitors engaged. But by mapping that out in the beginning, that became something that they could test through their formative evaluation. So I think what would be useful for you as you're thinking about what is it you want to learn, I think you want to map out what are the elements of your program and, and why do you um, engage in those elements? Why are those elements there? Because that gets us to give you something to begin to think about testing. Um, what you also want to do is map out where you think you know something about your program and where you feel you have very little knowledge at all. It's really important to think about what do you know, what do you think you know, but you're not absolutely sure, and what don't you know at all. And if it's something that you, you know, I think you want to map out, well, how do I know this? What's the evidence that's there? And once you, again, start to answer those questions, it gives you a really good idea of where to investigate things. Sometimes you want to investigate the things where you're not clear at all what's happening in a certain area. Another time, it makes sense to really work on the things that you, you think you know, but you're not sure. Um, testing assumptions is one of the key strengths of formative evaluation. It really helps you to investigate whether what you thought is going on is actually what is going on. Um, so that's another thing to think about as you're trying to figure out what is it that you want to learn. Um, another uh, way to think about figuring out what you want to learn is the types of feedback that can form new directions or potential improvements that you're hoping to make. And really, this is the critical lens for thinking about the usefulness of a formative evaluation. If you gather a lot of information, but you really can't act upon it or do anything with it, um, it's not going to be useful for a formative evaluation. And for you as a professional, I think one way to think about the strength of a formative evaluation is it will be more useful for you if it gives you information that you can act upon rather than gives you information that others can act upon. Because you won't, um, if it gives you information that you can act upon, it becomes more directly useful. If it's dependent upon others acting upon it, one of the challenges is trying to convince the others that they need to act upon that data. If you think you're going to, going to need to collect information that others will need to take action, it's really important um, to involve them in the evaluation process. Um, years of research on evaluation use shows that there is some connection between involvement in um, the evaluation process and the usefulness of the evaluation data. So thinking about how it can form new directions is really important. Um, and then also you want to think about, given all this, what do you need to learn from the participants or perhaps you're doing an evaluation with other staff members. And that helps you to really round out what your evaluation should be. So um, once you figured out what it is that you want to know, um, what's important for the next step is to select your, your instrument type. Many people um, equate evaluation with survey. I often see people use those words interchangeably. But there's so many different ways that you can collect and, and gather data. We're going to talk about three different main ways today, which are surveys, which could be written or online, interviews and observations. But in fact, there's a variety of different ways that you can collect data. Sometimes you might collect data from um, program materials. If you have people engaged in an artistic endeavor, you might use, actually use the product of what it is that they create as um, data that you collect and that, that you look at. Um, you can also use, um, if you're having any sort of information technology experiences, I'm sure many of you have read about, a use of a lot of analytics. Um, to, as, a, as a data source. There's many different data sources that you could use, but we'll talk about the three main ones, which are observations, interviews, and surveys today. And different instruments suit different types of needs. So if you want to know what's happening in a program, it makes more sense to actually observe it. If you want to know what people are thinking, then it 
makes more sense to do interviews and surveys. So thinking about what you want to know helps to guide what type of instrument you want. Um, you also want to think about when you're selecting your intern type, there's some kind of logistical, practical um, considerations, and one of which is where can you spend more time? So if you are very crunched on time between um, when the program is um, starting and when you're planning your evaluation, oftentimes I won't recommend going with the surveys. Um, surveys and their close-ended responses take more time to craft. Um, you have to pay a lot of careful attention to the types of um, categories you're giving visitors, to the exact wording of the questions. It's just more time intensive. And so um, then you want to spend more time analyzing the data on the back end and perhaps do something like an interview um, where each and every word is not as essential as it is in the survey, although you do need to pay attention to your interviews. Um, if you do an interview, you have to recognize you're going to have to spend more time on the back end in terms of analyzing data. It can be more time intensive. So you just want to look at um, where you have time in your, in your timeline for conducting the evaluation, and then that might influence your instrument type. You also want to consider the time intensity of the instrument on your visitors. So interviews take more time for visitors than a survey. Um, and so that's another consideration. And then a final logistical consideration is just your capacity for collecting and analyzing data. If it just scares you to think about how you're going to process all of those open-ended interview um, statements, then um, maybe you do want to go with um, more of a survey. If um, the idea of even just simply tabulating survey response or generating um, other kinds of what we call descriptive statistics, like um, averages or um, or um, modes or medians, then you may not want to go on a, on a survey route. So knowing where your strengths and weaknesses lie is really important when it comes to selecting your instrument type. Um, so with regards to kind of different instruments and just to kind of give you some pros and cons to help you think about this a little bit further. Um, written surveys are probably the most commonly used in museums. Um, one of the key strengths, and this cannot be underestimated, is their ability to be disseminated to multiple attendees directly following um, a program. So it's something you can hand out immediately, and they don't take that much time. Um, they can be printed in large print and braille. That might take some negotiating to make sure you get the right um, forms to the right individuals when you're working with groups. Um, and they work really well Well, if you think you know what the categories would be that you would put on the survey. So if you can, if you already have um, worked a lot with this audience and you've heard a lot of their considerations and so you just want some sort of quantification of where people stand and you want to confirm some really informed assumptions that you have, surveys might be the way to go. Um, some of the cons about surveys is that you really have few opportunities to clarify the responses. Um, and it also doesn't allow participants to easily share ideas that you hadn't considered. So one of the problems I've seen in surveys in many different situations is that um, when they give visitors a list of choices to choose from, none of those choices are the ones that really matter to visitors. And so that's what you have to really think about. Um, you, If you're um, disseminating a written survey, people need to fill it out right there in that moment. And if their time is short um, and they want to see other things in the museum, they may not fill it out in that moment. Um, the other challenge is that you may have some visitors for whom um, neither large print nor braille works, and you will need to read aloud those surveys to some of those participants in the program. <coughs> Excuse me. And in essence, what that becomes is then it becomes more like an interview, and it becomes time intensive anyway. So knowing your audience can really influence um, whether or not a written survey works for you. Um, the other type of survey um, that a lot of people are using are online surveys. Um, one thing to think about is that you can actually administer an online survey directly after a program if you have things like iPads or um, tablets um, or other laptop computers that people could um, use that you don't mind using them. Generally, however, online surveys or through email are conducted um, at home by the visitor. Um, collecting email addresses takes less time for the participants than it does for you to have them complete the survey in the moment, but it's very uh, saves time for the visitors in the moment. Um, and visitors might have more time to fill out the survey at home than they do 
right after the program. So we actually have a, a survey that we administer online here at the Museum of Science that has, I would say, at least four times as many questions that we usually have in our paper-based surveys. Because we do find that people are more willing to fill out those surveys at home. Um, they can also be more accessible if you're doing an email survey than some of the online software. So by an email survey, what we mean is that you send um, the participants all the survey questions in an email and have them um, email back to you. And so that might be better than using some of the existing online survey software in terms of their accessibility um, for people who are blind or have low vision and use screen readers. Um, the, another pro is that online surveys make analyzing the data easier. <laughs> worry about entering um, the survey responses into the computer. Um, the online survey does that for you. Um, and again, just like the paper survey, though, it works best when you're confirming informed assumptions. Um, one of the things to think about when it comes to online surveys and blind and low vision visitors is um, you want to choose software that is accessible to a screen reader. Many of the softwares are, but you also need to write the questions in a way that will be accessible for visitors for blind or have low vision. So here's a, just a quick example of how you might think differently about writing your um, online survey. So generally, um, when you are um, writing your survey question, you're assuming that the uh, sighted visitor can see um, the format through which the response should be added. So for example, um, you might say, what did you learn here that you didn't know before? Question mark in your online survey. And there would be a box underneath. Um, that you could use where, where people now know is kind of an open-ended field response and they can write in their response. Um, not all screen readers and not all um, online survey software tell the screen reader user that there's that box. And so they hit tab and they don't know that there's it's an open-ended response that they need to be filling in. So it's useful to kind of say, place your comment in the box below um, as a way of kind of adding more descriptive information. Um, also, a sighted visitor will know how many different choices there are after a closed-ended question. Um, that information is not immediately available to a screen reader user. So um, you'll want to make sure you tell them there are eight choices below to choose from. Um, so you can make online surveys accessible for visitors who are blind or have low vision. It just takes a little bit of a different approach. Um, so some of the cons of online surveys is that um, participants may not always respond to the survey once they leave the program. Um, we definitely see a higher response rate, and that means the percentage of visitors that fill out the survey versus the percentage of visitors versus the number of visitors who were given the um, survey. So we do see lower response rates if it's an online survey. Um, one of the cons is that the program experience might no longer be fresh in the participants' minds. Sometimes you want that. You want them to be reflecting upon something a week later because um, that's what's important to you. But if you want kind of their immediate reactions, it's harder to get that with an online survey. Um, some participants may not be savvy enough for online surveys. Um, another consideration if you do an email survey is that um, if you email someone to hear my questions and they respond back, um, they know that you know who said what on that, on that response, which is not true for an online software. Um, I talked about needing to be accessible to a screen reader. Um, and then just like the written surveys, online surveys are difficult um, with, to let participants share their ideas that you hadn't yet considered. Another common instrument that's used are interviews. Um, really a strength about interviews is that you can either conduct them for an individual or you can also look at them at a small group of individuals. So if you have a family that came together, you can do a family interview with all those individuals. Um, that makes it harder with the survey to get everybody in the family's opinion. Um, interviewing directly after the program ensures the experience is so fresh in their mind. Um, but again, you can also interview a week later through a phone interview um, if you do want that kind of deeper reflection to hear what people are still thinking about um, at a later date. In interviews, you can ask for further clarification. So um, if someone says something and you're not sure what they meant, you could say things like, Tell me more about that. Um, I, you, you said this. Can you tell me more about what you said, what you meant by this word here? Um, what's important about interviews is that um, you can also 
those probes and asking for further clarification. What you want to be doing is get more of a response from the participant and not be careful not to tell the participant what you think. Um, so a way of not asking for further clarification, just to kind of give an example, is say I interviewed Anna. And Anna said, I was really disappointed in that program. I shouldn't say to Anna, yeah, I was disappointed too. Um, I didn't think that the program really hints the main ideas. Is that what you thought? Because um, now the person is probably going to say back, yes, I agree. They didn't hit the main ideas, even if perhaps the reason why Anna was disappointed in the program is that it just wasn't snappy enough for her. Anna likes snappy. <laughs> um, and so you want to be really careful in interview in terms of how you probe and leaving it um, open-ended with tell me more or in what ways or how, how what, or what makes you say that. Those are all really useful probes. We're actually asking them, um, put, you want to be careful not to put words in, words in their mouth. Um, the other strength of interviews is it really allows participants to share ideas you hadn't considered. It's not uncommon in an interview for participants to say, you know, another thing that you hadn't asked me about uh, that I think is really important is X. Um, and that sometimes is where the most useful form of evaluation data come in. So interviews can really be useful for that. Um, what is hard about interviews is that they can take extra time to execute. You obviously cannot, if you have only one data collector and you have 15 people, you cannot interview all 15 people immediately after the program. Um, sometimes it can be difficult to record everything um, that the person is saying verbatim in a legible manner. Um, that also leads to shortcuts in the note-taking, and then those shortcuts can sometimes lose some of the meaning for the participants. Um, the other thing you want to keep in mind in an interview is that um, we found this path it's really helpful to have a printed version. Um, available so that if someone is having difficulty hearing you, um, they can also look at the questions. Um, so you might have some visitors who are um, have low vision and are hard of hearing, and it would be really useful for, for you to have um, a large print version of your interview guide available so that they can um, understand what questions it is that you're asking in a, in a better and more meaningful way. Christine, before we move on too far, someone has emailed in a question asking, is there an online survey site that works best with screen readers that you recommend? Ooh, that is an excellent question. We have investigated this in the past, and I don't remember our responses. Anna, do you have any thoughts? I know the software we're using right now, Fluid Surveys, is accessible um, because that was one of the, the criteria for choosing it. But I don't remember offhand the, the rest of the investigations that we did but that could be something that um, we can, I can poke back into my notes about, and we could send out uh, when, when the, this link to the webinar goes live. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Marta. And there was one more comment from Francesca. She mentioned, you must consider the challenge of how people with low vision will be able to fill out a written survey while at your institution, right? Yeah, so that's why we were saying the large print becomes really important and then recognizing um, the fact that um, having multiple versions, large print, braille, um, you can also, um, some people do have assistive devices that they bring with them, um, and that's another con of the written survey um, that we mentioned, which is that what you'll need to do is, um, in many cases, read aloud your survey to many of the participants. And so knowing who you have in your group becomes really important for deciding whether or not that written survey should be used. Um, okay. Oh, and I just want to say, so that um, becomes a reason why if you did have available um, tablets, um, laptops, other devices that you could use and you were, um, and you had access to online survey software that could be accessed through screen reader. You can also do that in the moment um, at the museum, which we have done in the past. Um, okay, so observations. Um, this is one, I think it's one of the more useful techniques for thinking about a formative evaluation that often goes underutilized. Um, what you can do during observations is you can really focus on the behaviors of individuals or small groups. Um, when you do that, you want to think carefully about what's an indicator of success. So I know a lot of times um, 
myself, when I was an educator years ago, for me, the behavior that really mattered was um, seeing people smile, and that is really important. Um, what I've also learned um, as um, someone who's now um, teaches in universities is that many times I just have students who are more smiley than others, um, and they just do that as a, their kind of natural affect. And so um, some of them will smile the whole way through and then ask the question that makes me realize, wow, they didn't understand anything I just said. I need to go back and, and change what I'm saying. So you want to find those meaningful behaviors. So maybe it's a way that they're um, looking at the object. Maybe it's uh, focusing in on you want um, your program to be generating conversation amongst the group. Does your program generate conversation? Um, really thinking about what behaviors matter becomes important for observations. Um, another strength of observations is that uh, data collection can take place during the program and activity, and you don't necessarily have to interact with participants. It becomes less um, intrusive for the, the participants' experience in terms of having those observations. The other thing that observations can be really strong for is helping you to understand what is actually happening during a program. So this might be useful if you have a large number of docents that are administering a program. You can use observations to get a sense for how consistent is the program from docent to docent. And it may not be important to you that's consistent, but at least understanding the range of the different kinds of ways that the program is being implemented um, can be really useful for thinking about where it's important to be consistent and where do you want to have variation. Um, the cons is that it can be time intensive for the data collectors, so it will take as much time for the data collectors as it takes for the program to implement in many cases. Um, and then also, as I already mentioned, understanding the motivation or outcomes of visitor behaviors can be difficult without complementary interviews. So I remember this um, years ago, I, before I had started doing evaluation as an educator on the floor, and I would um, see people nod, I'd see them laugh at my jokes, and I felt really good about what was happening. Um, and then as I started to do more evaluation and I would talk to visitors, I realized those same visitors that had been nodding and laughing at my jokes were coming away with complete misunderstandings of what it was that I was trying to achieve. Um, and that was a really important lesson for me to learn once I got over the guilt of having misinformed all these visitors for, um, that I hadn't interviewed before. So I think it's a way of thinking about sometimes it's important to have both observations and interviews because you can never fully tell from an observation what the participants are thinking. Um, feel free to keep asking questions over in the question box about kind of the instruments. I'm going to move on now to talking about collecting data. Um, we'll want to think about when you're collecting data, this is a systematic process. So systematic emphasis comes in in thinking about what it is you want the program to know. Systematic thinks about in terms of how you develop your instrument, but you don't stop being systematic when you collect your data. So you want to make very purposeful decisions about who you collect data from, as that will inform what you're able to say from your data. So do you want to make do you want to be able to look at whether or not your program works for a wide variety of individuals? Then you want to look at your program from people who have varying degrees of vision loss or different ages or different backgrounds. Um, making sure you know ahead of time who is it that you want to be able to know about. Um, do you care about participants in just one program or across a range of your programs? Um, do you want to be able to say something um, quantitative, in which case you want to do a random sample? So you want to make decisions about who you're collecting data from. And it's important to do that to you avoid what's called convenience sampling or bias sampling. Convenience sampling is, well, I'm just going to um, get these visitors because they happen to be here. Um, or um, I can call up Mary, Fred, and Joe, who've always helped me with my programs, and because um, I know it'll be easy to get feedback from them, and that, that's who I'm going to get feedback from. Um, but Mary, Fred, and Joe might represent a very different viewpoint um, than all the other visitors who are coming. Um, bias sampling is often unintentional. Um, so you're, you might say, oh, I want to talk to Mary, Fred, and Joe because I know I'll just feel more comfortable with the type of feedback that they're going to give me. I don't know what these other people are going to tell me. So that would be a, kind of a, a friend bias sampling. You want to avoid that because that's not going to help you to really grow through your formative evaluation. The strength of formative evaluation, the idea that it's cyclical and iterative and you might be keep doing it, is that for each question that you're investigating, oftentimes you can get a good feel um, for what's happening in your program with a very small number of groups. Eight to ten is, can sometimes be sufficient. Um, 
this is something that's really hard when I teach evaluation in courses uh, to graduate students. It's hard for them to grasp that you can really get a feel for what's happening in a very small number of groups until you try it out and then you realize, wow, these same these eight people have all said the exact same thing. That probably tells you that this is an area that the program needs to be improved. Um, also, thinking about um, collecting the data, you really want to make wherever you're collecting the data from, make them feel comfortable. So, using a, if you're doing interviews, using a quiet space with seating that's out of the way, um, asking them ahead of time about written versus oral format preferences and what they would like. Um, Another way to make people feel more comfortable is just to try to have the staff member uh, not have the staff member who loves the program collect the data. The participant might want to say something about um, what didn't work for them in the program, and if you're the one who led the program, they might feel uncomfortable. Even though you feel comfortable receiving the constructive feedback, they may not know that. Um, the other thing with collecting data is that you really want to consider the rights of the human subjects. So remind visitors that providing feedback is optional. Um, they don't have to participate, and their ideas will be kept confidential. Um, if possible, do not collect identifying information um, so that their comments can't be attributed to them. Um, certainly, it's best um, to obtain parental consent for children under the age of 18. Um, and if you're observing a program, it's a very, very, very good idea to let people know that you someone is observing the program and why and what they're planning on doing with that information. Um, as we talked about, um, when you're collecting data, you don't want to just design the instruments the way you usually have um, when you're working with a blind and low vision audience. So you want to modify the instruments and collection protocols for visitors who are blind or have low vision, um, introducing questions clearly, reading through the questions in a descriptive manner. So if you have a closed-ended response, um, even sometimes in interviews you might have, let them know ahead of time um, what those closed-ended responses um, are that they can choose from having large print instruments on hand. Um, and if you're conducting an interview with a small group of individuals, it's important to have a way um, for um, people to know what others are responding. So sometimes what we do in the sighted community is we say, raise your hand if you think X. Um, and so that doesn't help other people who might be blind know how many people are saying that. So you want to read that back to them. Also, um, when you're collecting data, you might want to distinguish between the number of people with disabilities who felt a certain way and the number of people without disabilities who chose a certain answer. That might help to inform your decision. Analyzing data is probably one of the trickiest parts. Um, the key to starting to analyze your data is to revisit the questions you had hoped to answer. So. Um, Go back to those initial questions. What were you hoping to learn? And that gives you a really good starting framework for looking at your data. Um, if you have qualitative data, you want to start by identifying potential themes and patterns. What sort of themes and patterns that you think you're seeing over and over again? And start going through and counting how many times those themes or patterns appear. Um, if you're working with um, closed-ended responses, you want to count each of the data points. Um, and do kind of a frequency tabulation. Oftentimes, if you're work, working with these small numbers of groups, that's all the statistics that you need to do is just counting and, or generating a percentage or this idea of five of 10 said this or five of eight said this. Um, after you go through that process of identifying the potential themes and patterns and doing your counts, um, you want to look at that to reflect upon the data and prioritize potential challenges. Um, it's really important to write up a one-page description that documents your findings and next steps, because um, a year later you might forget what it is that you found. And so even if you're just doing it for yourself, writing down um, what you think you found and tying your data to that will be really important. When you're analyzing the data, one way for formative evaluation and by working with practitioners to kind of keep yourself honest is see if you can get a friend or a colleague who helps you to identify those themes and patterns with you. And that's a way of really checking to make sure the patterns and themes that you think you see in the data are ones that are actually appearing in the data. Um, and if you have disagreements, go through the data together and figure out um, where you kind of collectively see those patterns and themes. So I think we're ready for some questions. If anyone has any questions or comments that they'd like to add after we've gone through all of that, so you can either use the chat box or 
uh, speak up on the phone to ask your question. This is Joan, and I have I have a question about the interviews, and that is, um, you seem to indicate that these interviews would be done in a group and not one on one. And what is the size that you would recommend then for a group, or or did I misunderstand that and they should be one on one interviews? I think interviews can be in a group or they can be one on one. I think if you start having more than three or four people, it becomes a focus group. Um, and so then you, you would have a different tactic. But um, I'm sorry that it, I am implied that it um, would be a group. I was just giving examples of how you might handle it with a group. And oftentimes we do interview groups because that's how people come to the museum. Um, but you can also certainly do one-on-one -on -one interviews. It's a great question. This is Emily Wolverton at the Mini Time Machine Museum, and I kind of wanted to speak on that, if that's okay. Sure. Um, we, uh, I've done the oral interview afterwards in a small group, and really it was done uh, because we only had a limited number of staff members that could conduct uh, the interview uh, in a timely manner. But I have to say, it, it, I really enjoyed uh, an unexpected benefit from that in that the members uh, fed off of each other's responses, and we ended up getting a really rich response that we wouldn't have gotten one-on-one -on -one when people might be more brief with their answers. Um, hearing the other responses from other people, it really fleshed out the impressions, the overall impressions. Any other questions or comments? All right. Um, we don't have a ton of time left, but what we might briefly do is just um, think through what the planning process might look like for an, a formative evaluation and go briefly through a scenario to think about that, that beginning of the process, since that's often the most difficult part. Um, so for the example scenario, um, we've created something that might sound familiar to many of you. Um, the example scenario is that our museum has created a test tour where visitors can learn about sculpting techniques. So in this program, um, to get a better sense of the artistic process, they can touch sculpting clay, various tools, as well as sculptures in different creation phases to really understand what that process is and how it ends up resulting in a final artistic product. Um, so that's really the focus of the accessible tour. That's what we're trying to engage people in to get them thinking about the artistic process and how it goes from, you know, rough clay to a final product. So first, as Christine talked about, we'd want to think about the information that we would want to gather about the program's development. What really do we want to learn from visitors? And what are issues that we could actually act upon that we could change? So for example, asking a question like, what other sculptures in the museum would you want to touch that's not really something we could probably act upon um, without significant curatorial buy-in, shall we say. <laughs> so really focusing on what can we change on our end for the program um, is something to really think about. So um, things that we might want to think about for this scenario, um, you know, one of the points of the program is to make this, this art accessible to people. And so one key question might be if visitors, especially the blind and low vision visitors, really feel included in the museum and in this program, since that, that would be a critical part. Um, and also thinking about on our end what could we change about the program, focusing in on those tactile elements of the touch tour, so those additional educational and interpretive materials that don't necessarily rely on the artworks in the galleries. So those would be two things for this particular program that we might think about that are really critical, we think, to the running of the program and are also under our control. So now that we have uh, figured out what we want to learn, we want to think about the instrument type that we would want to use. And based on all of uh, the things that Christine said, we want to think about the strengths and weaknesses of doing a written survey, an online survey, an interview, or an observation. Um, so really thinking about what the format of our program is, who our typical audience is. And for this scenario, um, you know, really getting that immediate feedback from participants we thought would be important. And um, 
providing detailed open-ended answers. Um, so an interview would probably work well. And that, that would also work in a time where you might be able to bring in additional staff members to help out, whether it's a few educators stepping in at the end of the program to help with individual or small group interviews, or maybe a cadre of summer interns that are about to show up for many of us. <laughs> um, so we've decided what we want to focus on and what the big questions are that we want to answer, and we've figured out that we probably want to use an interview, that that will give us the, the quick feedback, some of the open-ended responses, and we do have the staffing for it. So next, we want to think about really selecting the questions. Um, and this is where the question bank at the, in the second half of the formative evaluation guide might be able to help, help people out. Um, we do have some questions that we've used that folks at other institutions have used to really get at some of these things. So we said we really wanted to focus on inclusion and the tactile elements. Um, so we would want some general questions about how included people felt, as well as specific questions about the tactile materials. And we would look at the sections of the question bank that um, talks about comfort and inclusion, as well as the section that really focuses on programmatic materials, since those are the two areas that we're focusing in on at this point. Um, and to give you an idea of the different strengths and weaknesses of the question bank, um, there are a lot of areas where there are multiple questions that relate to the same topic area. So depending on the kind of information you want to get, whether you think you want an open-ended response because you're really not sure what people will say and you want to allow for rich responses, that might lead you to choose an open-ended question. However, if you feel like this, I, I'm pretty confident this is the range of responses that people are going to give, so I feel okay about giving a closed-end response, and then maybe doing a follow-up to clarify if needed, then you might want to select a closed-ended question. So for example, in the question bank, there are two questions that we have related to inclusion. And one is really broad and open-ended that says, what can the museum make, do to make you feel more comfortable in the program? So this is really would be good at thinking broadly about the program, what elements um, could be changed to make people feel more included and really trying to identify problems. Um, so if you're really not sure about how inclusive your program is or if you're just getting started with a new audience, this could be a really good way to go uh, to really get that baseline idea of how comfortable are people and what can we do to improve that. Another question is a closed-ended question. Um, and it asks, based on your experience here today, which of the following choices best describe how you included, how included you felt in today's program. And then there are four options. I felt included in all aspects of the program. I felt mostly included, but there were a few moments where I felt left out of what was going on. I felt left out most of the time, or I felt left out the entire time. And this might be a good way to go. If you've got a program that's a little more established and you're more comfortable with, um, that you think, okay, I, I think it's going pretty well. I just want to confirm that people feel included. But then with this type of question, if people said that they didn't feel included or they felt left out most of the time, you probably want to follow up to ask them which program elements made them feel excluded or made them feel left out. So in this case, um, with our program, we feel like we have it down pretty well, but we just want to confirm that people feel included. So in this case, we might go with that closed-ended response to just you know, kind of take a general temperature. Are people feeling included in this program? And then if it does pop up that there are people who are feeling left out, we can ask some follow-up questions about that. So that's an example of um, one way that we might use the question bank and how we would choose between the different types of questions, open-ended versus closed-ended. Um, and then uh, we want to go through that process with all of the different questions we would want to ask, think about, are there demographic questions we would want to ask um, to learn more about our audience, their past experiences with the museum, things like that, as well as think about what introductory language we'd want to add to get people in a frame of mind where they're ready to give that critical, friendly feedback on the program to tell us about their experience, to really let them know why we're doing the survey and that we are hoping to get honest feedback, both good and bad, to improve the experience for them and for all visitors. <laughs> um, 
And it looks like we have a question um, in the question box. Um, as so are the follow-up questions later with that group or on a future survey or interview? That's actually one of the strengths of using an interview over a survey is that with an interview, if someone says, oh, I felt left out most of the time of the program, you can immediately say, oh, tell me more about that. Were there any aspects that you felt where you really felt left out? Um, were there parts of the program that you felt less included? Um, so if you're doing an interview, it would be an immediate follow-up. However, if you're doing a survey, you might take the responses back and analyze them and say, oh, no, it looks like more people than I expected were feeling included. In that case, the next time you run the program, you might want to ask some open-ended questions about what you could do to improve the program and make it, make it feel more inclusive and more welcoming. Um, so I think it depends on whether you're doing an interview or a survey, whether you'd be able to do that in the moment follow-up or ask different people the next time around. So Francesca has sent in another comment saying, it is also important to consider if you will be including sighted caregivers, friends, and family who accompany people with low vision on programs in the evaluation and how their answers will be included in the findings. That's a great point. Um, and that's often, as Christine said, people often visit museums and groups together, whether it's a family group or a caregiver coming with someone. And so it's important to acknowledge that that's part of the social dynamic of the program and the museum experience. Um, what we often try to focus in on is if there is a small group, to try to get the feedback of that target audience, which in this case would be the person who's blind or have low vision, to, to address them first and ask for their feedback first, and then ask others in the group if they have opinions. So that way, you're getting a less biased response from that person. They don't feel like they've been pushed in a certain direction by other members of their group. But you're also getting feedback from everyone else who had that experience with them. So that's a really good point, Francesca. Yeah. 